Good evening. Um, I'm glad you're all here. I think maybe a few more people might might filter in. Um, I'm here to, to introduce Elizabeth Whitaker. Elizabeth has a practice as an architect. She has a practice, Merge Architects, in Boston. She teaches at Harvard. Um, she was the recipient of numerous awards for her student work and has continued to receive recognitions. We were talking a few minutes ago how she continues to get awards as an emerging architect. <laughs> um, I'm sorry? They're still emerging, and maybe that's yeah, maybe that's a, a good place to be. And I think that's evident in in the work um, she teaches. She teach has taught at MIT, Northwestern, BAC, and is on the faculty at Harvard now. Um, in looking at her work, um, I admit mostly through pictures. Um, what I really like is 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 um, a real you know sensitivity, a care about materials, which I think a lot of people here will be really sympathetic to, and a kind of at the same time a kind of a a precision and a care in the work, which I, which I really admire. The other, I think, exciting thing for us is she's got a housing project going up in Brush Park nearby, maybe other things to come. I, I hope they will, they, we will see more of her work here. So please help me welcome Elizabeth Whitaker. Thank you. Am I on? Okay, great. Well, thanks for having me. I love this room. I've said that like 10 times already. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I uh, have gotten to know Detroit um, a bit in the last like year and a half since I um, did get these projects at, with Brush Park, with Bedrock, um, and they've been amazing. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that project. I'm also gonna try and I'll watch the clock go um, not over an hour, right? Is that right? I have about an hour. Um, and talk about just the, the practice and what we do and how we think. And I, I um, like to talk to students about the trajectory of a practice because we are still very much on that. Um, and in no way have we emer emerged. I feel like we, sh we are still emerging. Um, but I think it's important to show how we have gotten projects like Brush Park and the, a lot of developer projects. We're probably working with seven or eight developers right now doing much bigger stuff that I can't even show yet. Um, but I am gonna talk about Detroit. And so we are in Boston, just a little bit about where we are, because I think it's important to say that I am very much um, located in Boston, but we did open a satellite office last summer in Detroit um, in the Chrysler House. It's a kind of a touchdown place for now. Um, we're doing work randomly in various places outside of New England. Um, we're working in, we've been doing a lot of work in Panama City, Panama um, over the last few years. Uh, some walk-in health clinics. We're doing um, some schematics for a city in Southeast China. Um, that we worked on a year or so ago and doing some work in Iowa, Martin Luther King um, Park and Innovation Center and now Detroit. So the practice is get, starting to get out there. Um, we're in the heart of this booming place, which reminds me of Detroit a bit, um, the seaport area, which was more like this map, um, a lot of open space um, and promise, a uh, bit of a blank canvas. It's now practically full figure ground. There have probably been 16 buildings that have gone up in the last four years in this area. And so we're right in the heart of it, which is uh, right across a channel. Can you see my cursor? Yep, from downtown Boston. So we're very, we're right there. Um, and here's a good aerial and all of this has been developed. So we're surrounded by development and construction and yet this is the history of Boston. So I usually show a couple of these um, just to help you understand the context with which I am building in for probably 75% of our projects, uh, maybe more. And it's a really tricky city. Not only it's beautiful, it's very traditional, a lot of it, although we do have our masterworks um, from some amazing contemporary architects over the last 100 years. But um, it's a stronghold of tradition and the city processes, um, stylistics aside, are very complicated and very challenging to build anything. The city is based in terms of zoning so that you have to ask for just about any project you need to build and go through a long approval processes with the city and the neighborhoods. So there's a lot of passion about this kind of architecture and also, believe it or not, these 
very simple triple deckers, which are also everywhere um, in Cambridge and Somerville and East Boston, where I'm building a lot right now. So I think that's a bit about where we work. Um, now I want to talk about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. So we've been really interested in crafts and who isn't. I mean, we're all builders and makers. Walking around, this school reminds me of my undergrad, which was North Carolina State College of Design. I did my master's at the GSD, but my undergrad is so near and dear to my heart because it was such a mashup of um, making. It was an art school, textile design, landscape, and architecture. And so there was this kind of frenzy of young raw talent abound. And I, I feel that when I'm walking through the corridor here with all these models. Some of the um, inspiration is not necessarily architecture for me, although of course it is, but I look at um, artists like uh, Tadashi Kawamata and these sculptures that um, have come out of this work, um, which is about uh, more of this, like what can we make with these bare bone resources? Because a lot of our early projects were that, um, which I'll show you, um, go through some really small ones really fast and then get into some of the larger ones. But I think, I think it's important to, um, and this is really great, this is Toshiko Haruchi um, making this beautiful spatial uh, installation in place out of this um, textile design. So what we've had to do with a lot of our early projects is find what we call the core project. Um, and the core project is when you have a very small budget and you have to put the design energy in somewhere very specific. So you can't have it everywhere. Um, so we, in terms of where we actually put what we call the core project, which is maybe the piece in the project that is what we call the heart of the project. And so what we do is we, we try to find, like some of these really early projects we thought of more as installations. Um, and we made them ourselves. So instead of, we haven't, we're not a practice that's had a lot of installations in shows. Instead, we've treated a lot of our early smaller projects as installations and experimentation with material. This was a uh, uh, small restaurant where we took this, um, the client asked for this abstracted mountain landscape. Um, we weren't sure what that would be. But what we did is we took these um, cotton straps in four different widths, half inch, uh, three quarter, an inch, and I think an inch and a quarter, and wove this um, wall around plumbing pipe and, and, and gave him this um, kind of uh, two-roomed restaurant that was all about the abstracted landscape and the real landscape. We also look at fabrication, kind of what we call it a low-tech, low um, sometimes higher-tech, but high-touch craft. This is a um, project that we designed for uh, actually a couple of Harvard Business School guys that have a firm called Q-Ball. And they do all sorts of interesting things where they um, have been very successful and created, a, I think, a, a, a burger joint chain in Chicago. They wanted to, what they said, Starbuck the nail industry um, a few years ago. And now they have, I think, 20 of these. So they hired us to invent um, a, a prototype. Um, let me see if I can go back. Uh, that they could deploy throughout the country. So this was an idea about how do we create an economical branding mechanism with these four by eight sheets of plywood um, that we CNC cut these giant pegboards, left the imprint of hands and feet um, for their product, and then put it on a two by four framed wall and backlit it with Christmas lights. And what that allowed, it was super inexpensive. It was very unique to the product and it allows them to translate this and scale it up or down to like a, you know, a strip mall in, in, the, in the Midwest or wherever, which they're starting to do. So it also just from the material provided this opportunity for a second program at night. So they actually now, because it, it feels more like a, like a nightclub, they rent it out for evening venues and they have a second source of revenue. So how can simple material ideas actually create um, new program opportunities, for example? So one thing leads to another. This is a small residential project where we took the same idea with the pegboard and we inserted um, over 42,000 wooden dowels at different depths to create this undulating surface to house the client's um, book collection. And so, you know, this was during the recession when I just really wanted to make something. Um, and this is one of the many projects that we've built by hand, um, which you can do when you have really small projects. It gets a little harder when you're starting to scale up in your work and how you bring that kind of sensibility to the larger projects um, with real budgets and sometimes union labor. So the 
Another project, um, this was an orthodontist clinic. So we'll do just about, we work on with many different programs if we think we can get a project out of it. This was um, probably about a 3,000 square foot space. We had a GC that built it out. He did fine, but when we showed him the drawings for the wall, uh, this curved wall, he said that's gonna cost $250,000. I don't know how to build it. And so we asked if we could borrow his boom for a couple of weeks and we built it for 25. So the way that we can kind of intervene into these projects and start to bring this spirit of the installation and the hands-on into the work um, is something that we've been really excited about. And I think that you'll see in a minute that level of interest and um, uh, direct uh, contact with the actual making of the pieces has informed some of our housing projects as well. So that's the kind of core project piece of it. Um, the next one is uh, this idea of social ecology or choreography. So we are really interested in how people use our spaces and, and you know, every architect is, but we have been working with um, simple things like the proportions of a, of a chair can change the dynamic of an entire space, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but we're starting to work with um, bigger clients about this concept and we're working with Google right now. We have been for the last couple years on um, one of their expansion projects and really rethinking the workspace um, and the kind of um, uh, details that go into it to inform different ways of working and a variety of working situations. So this next project is, uh, the client was Lincoln Laboratory and they're amazing. They have about a million square feet, of, a million square foot facility outside of Boston. Um, and they're an incredible company. They work with the US government and they, actually invent um, uh, devices, drones. Um, they invent new radar systems for the US military, but they have this super dry facility that's a double loaded corridor, engineers um, flanking it. And they've been collaborating with MIT for, I think since the 50s, um, on these projects called capstone projects, which are incredible. They work with the students, they invent really amazing things, and then if it gets legs, they take it out to the big guns out in Lexington and they put it into, into production. So what was happening is they were losing all their super genius students to Google at the time because they didn't have a really great space to work in. And a lab space is a tricky space to make um, fun and sexy and, and, and yet very pragmatic. Um, so they hired us to design and build their satellite. It's called Beaverworks. Um, it comes off of Skunk Works. And so they uh, picked a spot that's right on the edge of MIT campus. Um, and the charge was to create this uh, three zone space that was extremely social that would provide a place for to rapid prototype and make these these pieces and these these um these experiments but also to provide a social space and a seminar classroom space to make it completely transparent and yet be able to shut it down so we looked at um, programming the wrapper of the space but I would say the main uh, components were these key millwork objects which is a pod this seating banquette and this is, um, thickened wall, programmed wall that was the zone between the social space and the seminar space. So this is a, a project that um, uh, was really successful. The, the students love it. They're getting um, more hires after graduation, so we feel excited about that. Um, and we're on our second space with them right now with the Aero Astro Department and hopefully the third very soon. So it's a, it's a prototype that's working that we have been um, trying to implement for them on different sites. But this was a great project where we worked with a union shop, um, very tight budget, very expensive construction per foot, and we really had no budget to do all the key pieces. So we actually built um, a lot of these components ourselves for the space, and we designed the lighting, and we built these in our office, um, and then collaborated with uh, a really great millwork shop called Rad Lab on this giant pod and we built it kind of 50-50 on site. So starting to scale up, still keeping the involvement um, in the projects and the site and the construction. This is a restaurant where we designed a series of benches on wheels that were um, just a couple inches lower and about six inches wider than a typical bench. But what that does, those simple metrics, um, provides this opportunity for people to sit um, back to back, which they do. 
um, and meet and then reconfigure the space every night depending on the situation. So it's a very subtle detail. We're s really in the weeds with these dimensions, as silly and modest as they seem, but they matter quite a bit. The space is like no other um, in Cambridge or Boston in terms of how it's used every night and reconfigured and how popular it's been. So I think that you know, just showing quickly a few of these um, interior projects hopefully will be a good setup for how we started to get into developer work, which was frankly a really big leap. And we've been working with developers now for about seven years, I would say, seven or eight years, maybe eight years, maybe longer. Um, this was a, uh, is a project in East Boston, which is right here, right across from the city. Amazing views, a working class neighborhood with a lot of those triple deckers, um, everywhere, uh, so not a lot of historical architecture as I think of it like Beacon Hill, but very much the triple decker which they surprisingly um, romanticize. Uh, and, but incredible views to the city and it's, it's really starting to boom in this area because it's one of the last frontiers that's still somewhat affordable. So we were lucky to get this project which is right next to an active shipyard. So we have this amazing um, uh, kind of context flanking uh, the west side of our site and the triple decker flanking the east. So there is probably, a, just FYI, a six or seven months, sometimes longer, intense process with the neighborhood where you're meeting every month, showing them schemes, and um, a lot of opposition. Um, and we were really thrilled after we kind of talked through the narrative of the site and how, we, how much we loved the shipyard that they maybe had forgotten about and how wonderful the architecture and not just the architecture but the modern spirit of this space with this um, artist community that actually works on these incredibly um, large and fantastic sculptures that you see here. This is right across from our site. That's our site before we built it. And so how could that become the actual um, stronger context? Uh, we work a lot in this historical fabric, which I think is why um, Bedrock uh, hired us to work with them on Brush Park, because we knew we had to um, somehow marry these uh, inc beautiful old mansions and the preservation of those with this contemporary um, architecture. So this is our site, again, flanked by the shipyard and the triple decker. So there's a lot of this. And so what we did is we um, really had to ma maximize the front facade, because that was our only chance of view and light. Um, there's a back, but it's very much a back. Uh, there is no view, there's a little bit of light. Um, and then the tricky thing with housing, so we really geek out on um, unit typologies and the kind of unit, so we think of them in a very pure way in the beginning. Is it a floor through, is it a maisonette, um, is it a flat, and so on. So we had to put nine units in this project, which was super tight, and then we had to incorporate two means of egress. And I know you might glaze over, but these particulars of housing are really hard. Um, and Europe doesn't have to do it. Uh, and so therefore they have really amazing housing and it's really tough to, sometimes it's not, but often it is to incorporate this, in this case, a cross grain common corridor through the units. So how does that work? So the good news is, um, as it often does in architecture, what is a problem becomes maybe its best asset. And it forced us to do these mezzanine units, which are really low ceilings, but voluminous because they open up to these double height spaces that face the water. So we literally went under and over this skewered uh, common corridor through the building. And so ground floor, we had also had to pack in nine uh, parking spaces, one for each unit two stairs, second floor, they still have private entries. It's the third floor, or the second level, uh, excuse me, we call it the second here, but um, where we have the common corridor that then accesses all the units. So you have to really figure out how to game code, um, especially in this country. Uh, and so this is how we uh, conceived of it. So just a quick, a simple animation about the, the nine tubes. So we stack the tubes, if it's gonna go. Maybe not, okay. All right, maximize the views. Had to carve out for the parking. Um, we could only go three feet below grade because of the water table, we're right next to the ocean. And we could only go 32 feet 
five inches because of an angry abutter behind us because we were gonna block his view. So we were literally shoehorned in every way um, and had to maximize every inch, which I, for some reason, find we, we often have to do with our projects, not so much with brush bark. Um, and then the idea was, again, to uh, go below and above this common corridor to have these really great views out. And then what we, tr we try to do in all of our projects is incorporate as much outdoor space as we can get. And it's, again, it's tricky in these tight zoning envelopes. But we um, built in a back uh, green space, roof deck, and then these recessed balconies. So we love these balcony spaces and what they do to the streetscape and the whole dialogue with the street and the neighbor when you're only 20 feet up in the air or even less. I think there really is a great dialogue with the pedestrians. Um, this is a very pedestrian friendly, active uh, corner of the city. Um, and then on the front facade, which I would say is the core project other than the complicated section, um, is where we really brought out the aesthetic and the sensibility of our work. So the idea was to have rapid and something very modest like corrugated metal and red cedar. Um, strategically red cedar, because even that was a high price point for this budget. And then to uh, distinguish the nine units with these um, giant um, steel and yellow super frames, and then wrap this, we call it a shrink wrap facade, wrap the facade with the stainless steel mesh over these triangular gusset plates. So the idea was that it's figural, but it's subtle. And the whole point of that was that we would start growing things on as a vertical garden and green screen um, for an area of the city that was not very green, as you can see from the shipyard. And it's reminiscent of the chain link fence, although it's a really nice um, mesh. It's from Germany. It's not chain link. And that was the way that we sold it to the neighborhood. So all of these projects have a narrative that we have to really bring the whole city and the neighborhood along with us on um, in order to get them through. So again, the shrink wrap facade, this is a, a quick diagram of the idea, um, a couple of renderings about the layers and then how this could become a green screen over time. And then the um, tedious task of actually sewing the screen onto these gusset plates um, with this incredible steel shop and uh, this man on the ground that used to work on sh uh, boats and netting for boats. So he was a, a great find and actually helped us um, put this whole thing together. And here's the, f the finished product. So what was, it's interesting because what was so concerning for the neighborhood was the context and how this wasn't a triple decker. But since then, we we're now working with another developer that bought the lot next door that we tore down and we're building another one with a Corten steel screen. Um, and then two doors down from that, we're doing a third project with that developer. So we're trying to create a new context for this um, pocket of the city through these projects. We're just gonna show one tonight. And there's the balcony and its um, closeness to the street and its um, proximity to the shipyard. And then a few images of the interior. This is the, the unit that was, we thought would be so compromised. Actually, there's uh, four of them. These became the best units because they have these mezzanine triple tier spatial conditions. And they open up to these double height living spaces and views out to the water. So we mix a lot of high-low. We will do really high custom um, components of our project and design them literally around IKEA or off the shelf um, uh, cabinetry and so on. There's a view from the roof deck looking out to the city. And so, you know, we, we were working with these small storefront projects and then we did a couple of housing projects. And so we were trying to bring in this interest and in, in dialogue with the street, with multifamily housing, with the public and so on into a, fa a single family house. And so this was um, a great opportunity to work with this brilliant uh, professor of engineering at MIT that we met through the Beaverworks projects. And he had been living in this home for, I think, 13 years. It's a really small, modest Cape house that one's one and a half story that didn't even have insulation, I'm pretty sure. And so he called us initially to, and he hadn't put any real time into it. He had been spending all of his time, literally for 13 years, out in the garden 
making this incredible landscape. I think he has over 84 different um, species, Japanese maple species. And that was his love, and he wanted to, he now has a wife and a baby, and he needed to expand, but he really wanted a space that opened up to the garden that had giant glass windows that was very contemporary. And so it was really um, tricky to figure out how to add on to this structure. Um, here's his garden. He made, he built all of those curved walls himself um, lovingly over the years. And so we started to iterate. We still do these very simple, uh, we work a lot in Rhino, we're doing a lot of um, 3D modeling, but we also build a lot of these super simple projects and these models when we're studying them. So we iterate, we iterate, we try to double the house, eat the house, build onto the house, take over the house, cut up the roof, how do we get light in, where would we have giant views? Um, and really at the end of the day, it just got completely consumed, at least con conceptually. And we started to think about, well, why don't we actually bring not just big windows, but bring the garden space into the house. So we landed here and we convinced him, let's start with a box um, and take down the house because at the end of the day, it made more sense economically, yay. Um, and we could start a f fresh, just expand the foundation a little bit and really think about it as a project that was more like a tree house. So the house is less than 2000 square feet. It's two stories with a basement. Um, and so I think it's compactness is what makes it so magical when you're inside because you're, it feels like you're in a tree house and you're partially in and partially out. And so the idea was to create a multiple gardens. We have five here. The big one in the middle carves down into the lower level and becomes a courtyard in the round on the first floor. And so it really, as a site plan, we think um, locks it into the site because it brings the green in to the space. And here's a quick plan. Upper level, the five recessed gardens. And what's great is what seems like it's, it's both, it's, these are transparent spaces. So they both divide and yet unite different um, program spaces throughout the house. So it's really wild to be in a master bath looking through a garden into your master bedroom or the office space looking through to your son's bedroom. So there are these great relationships that are um, layered, spa layered and spatial throughout. And then just a couple of views. We wrapped it in Corten steel, um, which we unfortunately had to photograph it last February before there was any garden blooming. Right now the house is orange. It's full on Corten. We're going to re-photograph it and it's about to bloom, hopefully. And so just a few images of those interior spatial relationships between the kitchen and the living room and how that courtyard engages with um, the living space. And in this space, you can actually see two garden spaces above with one courtyard below. And then it just the relationship of the stair and when you um, arrive at the top of the second floor, you actually see through the house down to the garden uh, across, also to the courtyard below. So all of that led us to Brush Park. So um, I showed him some other projects too when we interviewed, but I think, but I, I showed him some of those smaller projects, even though they seem irrelevant to the kind of work they were hiring us for. But I think it was important to explain how we think about material, how we've built these housing projects for very low prices per foot um, for Boston pricing and how we think of these social space, spaces and pockets, um, the courtyard, the garden, the balcony, and how that might play out at a place like Brush Park, which is full of opportunity. Um, so you know it, probably. Uh, that's it today, although they're starting to move dirt around. Um, and the Bedrock was smart to hire a whole bunch of architects to work on it. So they didn't give it all to any one voice. Um, you, you may know we're working with Loha out of LA, they are doing the big apartment buildings. Um, Studio Dwell out of Chicago, HAA, they've been amazing. They're kind of running the whole landscape, urban planning, uh, master planning, and they have several projects on the, on the site as well. But um, Merge is uh, engaged in these sites um, right here, right on Edmond Street. So I'm looking south, to, back to downtown. And so we... Um, we're lucky enough to get the duplexes, which align Edmond Street, and then these six aggregates of 
carriage homes. So the white one's right here, and there are two more rows of it back here. So these are the Loha projects in these four corners, like bookends. Um, uh, Studio Dwell is way back there and some on the side, and then HAA has a little bit everywhere. So that's the site plan. This was our scope, is our scope. I'm going to show you the carriage homes first. So the way I talked about it with Brush Park, with uh, Bedrock, was an idea about how to marry the duplex typology with the carriage homes, because when we got the initial master plan, it's still parking but there was a sea of parking, blank slate, sea of parking, and then this fantastic idea that HAA has and is now implementing for what they call the Muse, which is a big swath of green space that's gonna cut right through, north-south through the body of the blocks, which is great. So people will, in theory, filter through those that live here, those that may not, um, and it creates this wonderful social space already. So we thought, well, why don't we capitalize on that and not just provide parking, but how do we actually bring in smaller, more intimate garden spaces, private courtyards, semi-public courtyards, and so on. So really make this a happening inside the middle of the block. And then the carriage homes themselves are not a main street. They are along a created alley also in the middle of the block, running east-west. So there's a lot of intersection. Um, and we wanted to think of that as a kind of a, a macro and a micro idea. So just showing you a cluster. So this is our full carriage home scope. We have six of these aggregates, and they're about 11, 10 to 11 units each. Zooming in on one, what we did is very much like the house I just showed you in Lexington, Mass. Um, found a way to provide a courtyard as a kind of um, linchpin, kind of a void linchpin between each pair of units. So that, you know, that was, everybody got excited about that in diagram and then we were like, well, how's this gonna work in terms of privacy and so on. So one unit uh, owns the courtyard and has access to it with transparent windows. The other unit doesn't own it, does not have access and it will have um, translucent glass. So they get the borrowed light from the courtyard but not the, um, the access to it. And so, of course, those units will have a different price point. But the idea is that there is this mirrored relationship um, around these courtyards of these unit types. We created a, probably three different unit types and then a variation on two, so five total. So it's not a copy-paste kind of housing project. Um, we try to avoid that. We try to find economical ways to repeat enough that there's an economy of scale, but to make a variety of um, options and spatial and layout conditions for the buyers. And so just a couple of early images and schematics about what you would see. These are really tight in a, in a cool way. So they're very narrow, they're somewhat long, and yet they are full of light and these glimpses of exterior through this courtyard condition. They're two stories, some of them are three stories. So the roofscape, um, which I'll show, is uh, really important to this piece of the project, in my opinion, because they're a little bit lower than the duplexes and because of LOHA's higher mid-rise projects that surround it, the roof of the carriage homes is very much the fifth facade of the site. And so you hear about the fifth facade but with the roof, but this is literally a roofscape that will be viewed from all the outdoor spaces and all the apartments from the four corner buildings. So, and with the undulating roof that we um, uh, designed in this project, it allows for these really nice double height, one and a half story height interior spaces. So here's a unit that looks into and owns um, the courtyard space next to it. Um, just a slightly different relationship on the ground floor from the kitchen looking into this green space where of course it'll rain and snow. And then another unit type and its relationship to the courtyard. And then the um, formal studies of how we wanted to think about the roof. So not just as a really nice, not flat roof to look down on, but also how we could start to have um, this kind of um, uh, back and forth um, and uh, staggered outdoor space of roof decks. So the roof decks stagger from the north side to the south side, and then they provide this really great outdoor space for the people who are gonna live there, but also this super lively landscape that's just, again, like 20 feet up in the air off the street. And so here's how it's playing out, and it's 
pretty much going to look like that. We have a lot of red cedar. We're using the screen idea again that we used in East Boston, but, but differently um, as a growing screen. And then really looking at how these aggregates um, relate to and in, 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 uh, abut the alleyway and how that can become, you know, how the back is going to hopefully feel like the front and the front like the back. And so here's a quick view. Looking down the alley where it's not very wide, you can imagine, um, but these uh, second level shallow balconies, I think will provide a lot of life down um, to this corridor. And then we're working with these pattern pavers to try and really enliven it and bring off the geometry of the carriage homes down to the streetscape and the horizontal. And then a quick view of the back. So this is the side, this is the north side that will face the south side and city side of the duplexes. And so how we deploy that, so this is the kind of thing, of course, no one's gonna be up this high, but this is the sort of roofscape that you start to see when you're um, in one of these taller buildings. And so next, the duplexes, so this is the front run. They only run on one block. The carriage homes run on one, two, three. Um, there are about 36 of these, and they uh, are right along Edmond Street, and right across the street are one, two, three, four of these gorgeous old homes that Bedrock is um, uh, preserving and um, renovating. Uh, and so this one was a little bit trickier. So we had corrugated metal, we had mesh, we had some red cedar on the carriage homes. This one really was just a few feet across from these gorgeous Victorian homes, and there's a lot of brick. So we had a lot of early studies that were materially more like this. Um, but I wanted to show this. We didn't land quite here. We have a lot more brick now, which I'm excited about. But I wanted to show this image because this was an idea we had about really amplifying this idea of the muse at a more of a micro level and multiplying it so that there would be slots between these duplex units that you could filter through into the back of the, into the, back of the side, into the middle of the side, into the side, into the body of the block. Um, so we really looked at um, how we could filter people through the block and you know the residents and those that are pedestrians. There's a lot of retail that's gonna be on the corner buildings, not in our buildings, but on the Loha buildings on the four corners, there'll be a lot of new retail. So we're hoping there are a lot of people from the city that are gonna be on the site, not just the residents. Um, so we initially looked at two different types. We looked at what we called the stacked and the banded. And these two run east-west along Edmond, and the demising wall is kind of in the middle of the, of the chunk. And then the banded runs north-south. So, and they, they had their merits. Um, we thought we would go with one versus the other when we presented it to the client, but in the end, they asked for a mashup of the two, <laughs> which was tricky. We didn't design it that way, but now we have. Um, and we're, we're thrilled, um, but it, it is very much this puzzly kind of um, Jenga, uh, combo um, of the two uh, housing types, which I'll show you. So the stacked is the, e the east-west slippage and then how we started to morph it formally into these slots where people could pass through into the block, um, the common stairs. And then the back, um, what we needed to do was provide a carport for parking, which is typically kind of a horrendous structure. So we tried to make something um, fantastic out of it, which was simply to, not so simply, but conceptually simply, to create this landscaped roofscape um, that would uh, cover up the parking and be this great outdoor space that's sort of private because it's elevated for the, those that live on the south side. And this um, faces the backside of our carriage homes. So there's a really nice relationship with all the roof decks and the balconies and the roofscape of the carport for the duplex. And then the stacked is the north-south. Again, how we modified and modulated that formally to create this typology and then how these two came together um, as one project. And so you can see it, I think, best in plan. This is the stacked, this is the banded. So the banded units bookend on Edmond, um, the east-west inside of Edmond Street, um, Edmond Place. And uh, there are these gaps that are formed between the stacked units to allow for this filtration into the site. So just a quick view of the units, um, the two types, and how that worked. So this is a very different, um, I think, sensibility than the carriage homes. I think they're 
related, but these are going to be mainly brick and it's really an exercise in tone on tone and a kind of a subtle variation in the brick tone and the brick pattern and a little bit of the brick formation. We have, um, this is the backside, this was the Edmund Place front elevation. And so we obsessed over these end elevations and this idea almost of a still life collage, thinking about the elevation as kind of a subtle layer and thin layer on layer of the brick and the brick tone and the brick pattern. There's a little bit of a texture here with the brick pattern and how that would start to, be, you know, kind of start to feel like the, the massing is very blocky, but then the surface and the facades are a geometry in and of themselves as well. Very orthogonal. And then how that relates to the um, historical homes across the street. So certainly very contemporary, but in terms of context, uh, we, we incorporated the brick. We looked at a lot of transparent um, brick screen that we're working with at the lower entry levels. Um, and we uh, have a screen on this project. This is the backside with the carport. This is a corner of the carriage home. And then th I'm showing this slide because this is a slide that was shown um, to the neighborhood during the historical uh, meetings and the, talking about context and what we did is we found that a lot of these homes have these incredible giant clover single clover patterns um, on some of their um, detail at a, with a very different hand and so we found a uh, contemporary um, pattern that's out there on the market that is a clover pattern which when it's of course super small and multiplied throughout the entire wrap of the carriage homes and then these strategic stair towers of the duplexes looks very contemporary. And the neighborhood loved it and they loved the association with it and understood that it was contextual yet um, had its own voice. So, th that's, so that's Brush Park. Um, I also wanted to talk about a very different scale um, we're, I would say very different context. We are, we're building a lot of infill buildings in Boston, but we're also doing some new neighborhoods. Um, we're doing a net zero neighborhood in West Roxbury, which is Boston. Uh, and it's an area in the city that is um, quite affluent, quite protective of their context, um, which is quite traditional. A lot of gable roof, single family homes, not really any multifamily. And also very protective of this um, green space that f was right on the back edge of our site called Allendale Woods, which is gorgeous and big. And this was a single family lot. This is the house right here that we were renovating. And they, <clears throat> they um, my, the developer bought the lot and wanted to develop it into multifamily housing. <coughs> So it's been a two and a half year battle. Um, and what we are proposing here is um, not just uh, a typical development, but a net zero development with 20 homes. We're now down to 18. And so the idea is that it is going to be lead platinum, but built with fortified construction, which is a construction type I'm learning about, and will be a net zero project, which of course will produce as much energy as it um, takes up. And so the strategy behind that, I think, helped us create a contextual, um, contemporary interpretation of the gable roof that helped us to at least convince um, many in the neighborhood of the kind of architecture that we wanted to build here. Their biggest issue is density. Um, some still have issues with it stylistically because it's not um, as traditional as they would like. It's very contemporary. But nonetheless, the, the project started to design itself. The orientation, this is the property line, is um, this is a 40 foot drop from the front of the site to the back of the site. So it's a tricky terraced um, section, which helped us in terms of hiding the project from the main street, but made it really difficult to navigate in terms of roads and how you would get in and out of this property and how we would, we really wanted to avoid any kind of parking lot or too many cars, how you would nestle that and hide those into um, the project. So the project looks pretty rigid. I, we looked at, I don't know, 30 different site plans where we had these, they're actually townhomes by code, but they look like little tall single family homes. So we looked at so many site plans and you know, our instinct was to, um, kind of shift these around in a very organic way in terms of their figure ground because it's the woods and why would it need to be so linear. But at the end of the day, this worked best with 
our roads. It also worked best with being economical, I would say formally clean um, as a footprint, but then actually allow us to do more geometrically with the actual massing. So the building, this is the slope. Um, we thought of it, each unit, as essentially this in volume. Um, but then it's great because the site does not face due south and the, the roof slope for the PV array to achieve the net zero needs to face due south. So we were able to cut this um, asymmetrical uh, cut in each of these boxes due south, which gave us this really nice um, variety of roof types. And then we started to carve away, as we do, to create these outdoor spaces and this opportunity where this might be a party wall here actually provides a gap a visual and spatial gap between the buildings which preserve views um, through to the woods but also allowed for these really great um, kind of uh, uh, outdoor balconies and decks where you would be right up against your neighbor. Um, we chamfered this front um, to create a slightly different gable in relationship to the street and bring that massing down to the higher part of the site and then you know, nestled these into the site where we found a way to bury the parking under these houses um, and out of sight, which is great. And so again, just the cut, the simple cut, and how that affected the form making of all of these homes um, and how we then talked about it with the, the neighbors in the city. And so there was, this diagram was shown quite a bit um, and it helped us get here, which, does, which is very different from the context of the neighborhood, but as we brought them through the narrative of the project and how we were thinking about it, it started to make sense to them. So just showing how when you start to abut and mirror these townhomes with these um, built-in recesses uh, on the second floor, because the parking's below, then you get these double-wide, single-wide gaps through the project, out through down to the woods. We have to work with neighborhoods um, that will talk four months about the bay uh, and our interpretation. Um, this was again after months and months of negotiations with the neighborhood and how we really obsessed over this idea of what a bay is. And so we um, came up with this idea of an inverted bay which would allow for these um, benches and seats on the street that provided kind of a second and doubling of the stoop, which we all know is kind of the best social space in a city, is the front stoop. And so that allowed us and helped us to convince them to let us build something um, uh, like this in their neighborhood, which was full of the Bow Bay, the classic Bow Bay um, detail. And then as we're doing these projects, it, you know, we're, again, we're back to doing these um, really tight infill projects. And so for us, these are, I showed a couple of these because um, I think they, for me, they relate very much back to the kind of projects we did early in the practice, like the peg wall um, and our obsession with this kind of texture in the core project. So this is only 27 feet wide, it's five stories high, and we're working for the first time with GFRC. Um, and so far, so good. Um, we haven't built it yet, but it's going into construction in about a week. Um, this is a, another multifamily housing project with a neighbor, I mean with a developer, um, neighboring a very historical uh, building. So the way that we talked about this project with the city was how these datums would actually align with the trim work and some of these markers um, on this historical building. And somehow after, I think, wearing them down after months and months of um, presentations, they agreed to it and we finally got it through. But this is, you know, these, are, I probably had 30 diagrams and I would have to meet with the Boston Redevelopment Authority and move things three inches here and two inches there to get them to finally agree that this was something that they felt would be appropriate next to this um, beloved historical structure. And then uh, one quick project um, that I, can, I can't say too much about, but we're building a small boutique hotel um, in downtown Boston, also working with GFRC and trying to create um, the project in the project with this facade and which is um, actually shaped as uh, this idea of these um, kind of concave, um, almost like flute-like um, figures that will then describe these sleeping pods behind. So there are multiple beds um, stacked uh, behind the facade. There are 150 beds and it's only seven stories tall and 27, also 27 feet wide. So a really tight site. So 
this is a project um, that is much larger and how we are trying to really think about how you engage with the city as a, as a new way of actually weaving through the city blocks. Um, Brush Park has the Muse. We were thinking about a, a kind of a slightly different version of that where you would have these larger courtyard spaces that would interlink throughout the city blocks. We focused on this one building um, that is a uh, structure that's gonna have a single uh, studio spaces, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms. So very much a variety of user types and occupants and dwellers. This is a plan of how that the relationship with the site and how you could actually walk through the project um, and create these kind of um, kind of gardens and parks, mini parks off of the, the main streets and that would actually weave through these multifamily and retail spaces, mixed use buildings. So typical unit plan, um, we looked at um, a way to develop a, a, a module, a kind of prefab that we could dress up and add on to on certain facades. We chose to create balconies and overhangs. We chose the south facing facade, which is this one, um, because it, we thought it was the most social demographic, which is the single, the, the one bed. And that, um, this is an unfolded elevation showing, it's just a small piece of it. So the rest of the wrapper would be super taut, like a traditional housing um, facade, but this one had, would crank and would have this extended um, detail onto the prefab um, unit box. And then that would create this opportunity for these diagonal outdoor spaces in relationship um, to the occupants and you know how that would be the kind of social facade in the south facing with the shade. And then last, how am I doing? So last um, project I'm gonna show is a schematic we've been doing for a city in Southeast China. So these cities, in, I don't know if anybody's been there to China, but they have um, all this enorm enormous growth that you know of, but right next to it, literally 30 feet away from a 300 story, super mod expensive tower is what they call an urban village. And these urban villages are, <clears throat> um, basically these wonderful low rise uh, communities that have been a little bit forgotten and have not been kept up over the years. And you can walk through and see chickens getting slaughtered, a kind of makeshift barber shop, um, flower stand. And so it's full of life. And I was in China about two years ago and <clears throat> gave a series of talks which I thought of this, of this work, which seems so tiny in the context of what they're doing. And I thought they're never gonna be interested in this. And they were so excited about these ideas about small courtyards and these outdoor spaces. And so they um, brought me in to do the schematic of a complete renovation of one of these urban village areas, which is in the middle of the city. So, which is great. So the, the really great thing about it is it's it, their interventions. The idea was their interventions. There are, um, <clears throat> There are uh, full um, renovations, there are full teardowns, there are preservation. So the degree of, of how we would touch it varied from you know, full demo to total restoration. Um, so we looked at initially this main intersection, um, which is in yellow, and a few buildings along the way. Part of the problem was the, and then the main intersection, like the actual, the heart of it. Um, so buildings along the way and then the cross. Uh, the, the problem is the streets were really narrow, so they had a hard time even getting some vehicles through. Um, but there was this great kind of, you know, just pop-up street life, music, of course. People were selling things ad, ad hoc. Um, people in, in China, because it's warm in this area, are outside all the time. They play chess, they meet, they will sit out there for hours at these outdoor tables. And so what, we, what were we, what were we gonna do with this? So we had all these different building types um, aligning these two streets. And so we made this matrix of operations. And so we thought about, well, we can carve it back, we can lift it up, we can take it down, we can create new PLOT, we can float things on it, we can, we can uh, carve through it, we can um, carve under it. And so we started to explore just through um, a few vignette studies. You could do something really simple, like take an old wall, cut a few openings into it with a new frame and preserve it as a ruin in a way, allow for these layered spaces and spatial adjacencies to occur that weren't occurring before. Simple things like a bench would all of a sudden create a space between this, this um, ruin, this wall, uh, to create an area for a sculpture garden, for example, a place to sit, 
how we might carve into the street and underneath um, some levels of these homes and reinforce them to create an outdoor amphitheater for some street life and then just the just the surfaces for things to, to occur, for programs to happen. It's really hot there, so we looked at how we would span and actually help support some of these walls with these canopies. We looked at components that we thought the people on site, um, like four people could build themselves, so really simple um, handheld small uh, components that would make up these canopies. We looked at all these different um, you know, shapes and profiles and what that would be. This is a kind of a pop-up sculpture area, a canopy, flower shop, a pop-up garden. I mean, I'm sorry, a pop-up library. And then lastly, we looked at that main um, intersection, which we thought would be an opportunity to show kind of the concept, kind of the gist of the whole proposal for the entire neighborhood, which is this idea about a kit of parts that can create structure that implies architecture and enclosure, but isn't full enclosure. And then the way it gets divided up as the, these individual programs and pockets for green space and exhibition, and again, maybe a library space, and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Yes, of course. Questions? Questions. <laughs> uh, I was just kind of curious because you mentioned um, how you get so much resistance uh, from the people of Boston for like, producing new ideas. Uh, kind of, how would you, uh, for beginning students who are just kind mm -hmm. of in the world of architecture, how would, uh, what's like one bit of advice you'd give to someone who's handling a situation where you're getting like so much <clears throat> opposition to ideas? Yeah. So. Stay calm. <laughs> um, try not to sound condescending when sometimes things that are said to you are ridiculous um, and contradictory uh, from two sides of the room that are ganging up and they're asking for two things that cannot happen. If one happens, the other can't, that sort of thing. So you, you have to... Um, you have to be sincere, like really sincere. So you have to get in that mindset where you mean it, what you're saying, because you do. Um, because the, it's their neighborhood, it's not your neighborhood, right? And so I respect that. I don't want them to hate my building. Um, and I say that a lot. I'm like, I don't want you to hate my building, but we want to build something meaningful here. We're not here to build another triple decker. No offense. Um, we're here to do something else. And so if they... It, the problems are vast, so it might be about the way it looks because it looks weird, okay? But it, it surprisingly often isn't always about that. Um, it's often about density, and depending on what neighborhood you're in, what they think is reasonable and, and isn't. So these, all these parcels are zoned like FAR1, which is a floor area ratio, which means if your site is 10,000 square feet, you can only build 10,000 square feet if it's FAR1. If it's FAR2, you can build 20,000 square feet and so on. So there are parts of the city that are going four times the FAR or 10 times. We'll go in at a 1.0 FAR and we'll ask for 1.4 and they will practically throw me out of the room. They'll like, how could you possibly ask for more? You know, I'm like, have you not been reading the paper for the last eight years that the entire city is booming and everybody's asking for more FAR. So we try to be considerate. And actually, we are almost too honest with what we go in for. We, we don't ask, we ask for what we need. And I think a lot of people game it much higher knowing they have to negotiate down. We actually don't do that. We just, we go in with the developer and we're like, this is what we need, <laughs> need to make this project viable. And so we end up, um, you know, getting a very intense conversations about why we need it. And, these neighborhoods think that all that, you know, the developers are greedy and they're, they're insensitive. And I actually work with really great developers who, yes, they're trying to make a buck, but they're very sensitive to the neighborhood. And they've hired us because they want to do something nice that they think is going to be not just another triple decker. So it's kind of bringing them along. So my advice is to um, don't feel like you know more than they do. Don't go in there thinking, you know, that you're gonna outsmart them because you, you can't. You just have to help them get what they need, right? And you have to remind them often that it is a compromise. So sometimes they will ask for everything. 
and they won't give anything in the first few meetings. And then slowly you kind of, you know, you kind of come together. So, Thank you. yeah. Any more? What does the business side of your practice look like? A mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I say that because like it, I spend so much time on the stuff that I don't want to spend time on. Um, no, it's actually, it's pretty, it's, what does it look like? Um, well, I'm, I have, I'm, we have um, 15, 16 people now, so we've, we've grown. Um, and so it's, it's bigger and we're becoming much more formal in terms of how we, not as formal as we need to be in terms of how we work in house, right? Because it's, there's been very little hierarchy. We are all in there. It's very collaborative. It's, it's, it can be great in that way, but as, as we get more and more projects, um, it's becoming, you know, we need to, uh, we, we definitely have a more of a hierarchy in the office than we used to. We have a lot of senior people now, a lot of junior people, I can say that. Every, before it was sort of like, uh, you know, everybody's there, they're great, let's get it done. Um, so, you know, that's, I don't know, that's the business side. In terms of business, so I don't do a lot of marketing. Um, I need to, I forget, and I get busy, and you know, all that. And I did just hire my first um, admin person about a year plus ago, um, maybe it's a year and a half ago now. She's great, she's the um, head of business development marketing and office management. She has a very long title. She's reminded me lately is too much for one person. Um, so I didn't think she'd have enough to do in a week full time, but she, I need like three of her now. So we're working on that business side, as you say. Um, we do submit for awards, you know, that's part of our, part of our business side in terms of growing and, and getting exposure. Um, we, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. <laughs> the business side is very much a growing practice. Um, we're moving our office in like six weeks to a, a space that's four times the size. Um, so it we're, seems to be the thing that most architects aren't very good at. Right, right. right. <laughs> and, and it's hard to... Right. to yeah, I mean, I think you, okay, so my advice for you, if, if it's all about advice today, would be to ask a bajillion questions of anybody and everybody you know, including me right now, right? But I will often go to lunch with um, architects in Boston that are older than I am because they know more and they're so generous with their time and expertise and say, what do you do when this happens? Or, you know, what do you know that I don't know, which is a lot. Um, and you have to be... You have to be savvy and you have to be, um, let's see, you have, I wouldn't say aggressive, but you have to be firm in order to get paid. <laughs> um, and you learn that the hard way when you don't get paid. Uh, so it just takes time, I think. Um, but it, it's a balance between getting paid and not becoming hysterical <laughs> about not getting paid. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and you got to be careful with your clients because they're, we've been lucky for the last like six, seven, eight years, but the first five years I had to chase everything, every, everything, every check, everything. And, and, and that is not a fun place to be. Um, but now I have a better clientele, <laughs> I think, um, and they're grown ups, and I'm grown up a little bit more, <laughs> not a lot. Uh, so, it's better than it was, but it's still, you know, business side's hard. Ask questions. Get a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> really good lawyer. Don't call him too often, because he'll charge you. <laughs> okay. Um, there were two aspects of your presentation that really struck me uh, related to what we try to impress upon our students, which one is diagramming, mm. and another is, um, uh, iteration. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, thing that we talk a lot about with the students, different instructors approach it a different way, but um, mm -hmm. is precedence. Mm -hmm. and I was mm -hmm. just wondering whether precedence, yeah. You know, there's yeah. You presented there, there, there wasn't any. Uh, there's that chair sculpture. <laughs> so, so, and the crates. Um, yeah, can you talk about that? Yeah. Can you talk about it in terms of your career so far and how it's evolved? Okay. Um, so we, we, I, and we, my, my office, we look at a lot of stuff out there. My, it's funny, I, 
I think everybody in my office has disease, like as they're, you know, it's always up. You know, I'm like, hi, you guys. You know, but I, it's good. Like we're constantly looking, right? And I don't have time to look as much as they do, but, but I'm teaching. So I've been teaching at the GSD for the last seven years. Um, so I'm, I'm on sabbatical this year, which is, which is nice because I can do more of these. But um, so I'm looking, I'm looking at the student work. I'm, we're, you know, we're looking out there at publications and so on. And looking at buildings when I get a chance to travel. But it, precedents are um, important, super important. And I think one of the most important things to realize is that it's OK to learn from others. It's, everything's been done, right, in some way or another. You want to, your, your mind is full of things that sometimes you're conscious of, sometimes you're not. Just make stuff, right? And feed your brain with as much imagery, ideas, and discussion about architecture as you possibly can, and something great will come out of it. Um, I'm not afraid of precedence. I used to be afraid to show precedence in interviews or schematic presentations with clients because it felt like I was cheating. You know, we hadn't designed it yet, and I felt like this charlatan. I never did that. And then I started collaborating with this other bigger firm in the last couple years, and um, they show a lot of precedence. And I thought, you know, it's so, I'm okay with it now. It's so helpful when you're just starting a project to show images of spaces that resonate for you or buildings and to get a reaction from the client, how they feel about those images, because that's a sensibility that you're starting to gravitate toward on that particular project and nothing's done yet. So you can do your renderings, which are very specific, which we do. <laughs> along with, well, this is the screen kind of idea we're thinking about, or look how well this was done in Melbourne, Australia, and you know, and everybody gets all excited because most clients have a harder time vi visualizing it than, than, than you do, right? Because they're not architects. So showing them significant, a, a built project makes it seem real. So I think for a lot of reasons, precedents are, are great in terms of communication and great in terms of putting the stuff up on the wall uh, in the office and saying, this is what we like this week to the people that are working with you. And they can start to say, oh, I hate that kind of window, or that's an awesome overhang, or look how they use that brick, you know? So it's all, you gotta get over the whole arrogance of it, authorship. Just, you know, relax on that. <laughs> um, and yeah, yes? Do you have a shop fabrication lab in your current office? So we have some machines <laughs> that we pull out. In the new office, we're really excited because we're building in a little shop space. It's not very big. It's also the materials library, so we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> a little dusty. So yeah, we're planning to make more things in-house. That's part of the sort of ambition of the, the move and the expansion, yeah. Yep. OK. I know, it's late. Oh, yes. All right, just another question about materials. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned red cedar. Why red cedar? So, re so we, it's not super expensive. Um, it's more than cor corrugated metal. So it was, and it warms it. So we, we like, our, pr our projects are not all white and super pristine contemporary work. It's, we try to incorporate color when we can. A lot of, apologies, a lot of yellow. We just like it. Um, and a warmth of wood. So we try to mix these materials, the metal, the mesh, the wood. It's just, I don't know. It's, uh, I've been using red cedar on a lot of projects and it has, if they treat it right, it weathers really well. It's good for the Northeast, it's good for Detroit. We have some on the carriage homes as well. Um, and it's readily available, it's easy. And it looks, it always looks good. Um, you know, it always feels uh, nice on a multifamily project. It's a nice residential scale. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>